For several hundred years, this country experienced the horrible practice of slavery. It was a system that allowed men to buy, to sell, and to own other men. Slaves were beaten and mistreated and were worked without pay. The women were raped, the families were torn apart, and some were sold off at the wishes of the owners. The system of slavery was so ingrained in society that it became normalized after a while. And it was supported by mayors, law enforcement officers. It was supported by governors and senators and presidents and even the Supreme Court. When challenged with the words of our Declaration of Independence that says, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When confronted with that, they had to diminish the slaves so that they were less than human. So to keep the institute of slavery viable, they, they had to establish that black people were less than human. They had a, what is called a three-fifth compromise that passed and was accepted by the courts that said each slave is less than a full person. You know, people can do whatever they want to do to get to the point where they can support whatever they want to support. The supporters of slavery built their economy on the backs of slaves. The system supported the idea that white people were superior to black people in every way. And aside from the labor that these slaves provided, they had no value. They could be abused, they could be humiliated, they could be subjugated, they could be murdered and lynched without due process. After a while, there rose up those who were troubled about the injustice of slavery and they were called abolitionists. Some stood alone and spoke about the ungodliness of slavery. And eventually things changed. War broke out over the issue of slavery. The states that supported slavery said that the government has no right to tell us how to run things in our own state. They didn't call it the right to own slaves, they call it states' rights. The government and anyone opposed to slavery were told to mind your own business. They were willing to fight and die to keep from fleeing the slaves. They didn't care about the slaves. They only cared about how the slaves made their lives better. Even after slavery was abolished, there were still practices to keep the black man in his place and intimidate the black population. There was still the practice of lynching I was looking at a photograph just this week of a lynching, and some of, most of us have seen those photographs. 
It was a black man hanging on a tree. But the thing that caught my attention was not just the man that was lynched without due process. It was the hundreds of people standing around and there were men with suits and ties and hats. And I wondered, was this on a Sunday? And were they either going to church or coming from church? And it occurred to me that most of the people at the lynching identify themselves as Christians. Well, this is God and country. We are a country of believers and country of Christians, but we accept this institute of slavery and all that it represents. So standing there at the lynching were Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Catholics, sanctified folks who all said we support what is going on. They go to church, they sing hymns, they pray and listen to the preacher's sermons. But those who say they were the people of God find themselves supporting what is ungodly. The Institute of Slavery has many similarities to what I call the Institute of Abortions. What is abortion? Abortion is the deliberate termination of a human pregnancy resulting in the death of the embryo or fetus. Since Roe versus Wade in 1973, the practice of abortion has been ingrained in our society. Since 1973, more than 60 million abortions have taken place in America. And let me answer the question or the proclamation that comes first when we talk about abortion. What about those that have had rape and incest and the health of the mother? Well, of those 60 million, less than 3% of all abortions has to do with rape and incest in the life of the mother, less than 3%. So out of that 60 million, that's 1.8, so that leaves over 58 million abortions in this country. So abortions are supported by mayors and law enforcement officers, governors and senators, presidents, and the Supreme Court. Supporters of abortion attempt to minimize the impact by avoiding calling the fetus a person. They want to call them less than human. They say that it is the reproductive right of a woman and the woman should have the right to do what she wants to do with her own body. And they say to anyone who opposes abortion, you need to mind your own business. Like some who stand at a lynching Many Christians support the killing of those innocent lives. There are several questions to be examined. And we're going to look at them now. Do we have the right to choose what we do with our bodies? And then how did we get here? And then what does God have to say about this institution of abortion? And then where do you stand with your position on this institution? So I'm going to start from the beginning. 
We're going to look in the book of Genesis to set the foundation for what we are dealing with. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 4, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat of any tree in the garden? So the very first question in the Bible is to get Eve to doubt the validity of God's word and his authority in her life. And that is the question every, every believer will have to face today. Do you know what God said in his word? So the serpent come up to her and said, now, did God really say that? Eve knew what God said. Look at verse 16. We go back in, in chapter 2, verse 16, Here's where God is talking to them. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now I want you to notice something there. Notice God said, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. He tells, this tells us that from the beginning, God offers choices. Now, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the garden with the rest of them. He said, you're free. You can eat of any one you want to. God already knew the choice they were going to make. Notice he said, and when you eat, Not if you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, when you eat. God already knew. So, verse 2 in chapter 3, the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. And then the serpent speaks to her again and said, you will not surely die. This was more than a casual conversation. This sets the course for humankind and our function in the world today. The serpent said, you're not going to surely die, for God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And the serpent wanted to accomplish two things that we're still dealing with today. He gets us to question God, did God really say that? And whatever social issue or moral issue we're going to be dealing with is going to come down to those questions. Did God really say? And you're going to notice when you start looking, everybody who's doing something ungodly will begin to attack the Bible and say, well, the Bible don't really say that. Well, you know, that the man only wrote the Bible. You know, it's got so many interpretations. You know, you know, you know. Watch it, listen. When we were in Washington, D.C., we went to the Museum of the Bible, and they had a Bible on display where some slave owners had printed a Bible that took out the references to slavery and the freedom of the slaves and left in the part that says, Slave, obey your master. People have been trying to manipulate the Word of God since the beginning, and the separate started right off with Eve. So the first thing you want to get us to do is question God. Did God really say? And secondly, will you believe God when it's time to make a decision? 
it's time to make a choice. See, Satan wants you to believe that God doesn't want you to be happy. God doesn't want you to be pleased. So Satan tells her, now go on and do it. You ain't going to die. You're going to be fine. But God started off giving Adam and Eve a choice. The choice they made affected every human being that was born after them. Now notice I said, God told them, when you eat of this, when God gives us a choice, it is to let us know what he already knows. When you're in a crisis, or when you're challenging a circumstance, that moment, the choice you make will reveal if you believe God's word and if God has the authority in your life. Will you make a choice that please him or are you going to make a choice that please yourself? So let me just tell you right off. God is pro-choice when it comes to abortion. He always gives us choices. He gave Adam and Eve a choice. He said, you got a choice to live or you got a choice to die. God doesn't want us to be uh, so uh, controlled by him that we, we don't have any choice to love him on our own, a choice to obey him on our own. He gives us these choices. He has no problem with choices. He has problem with the choices we make. When it comes to the institution of slavery, I want to mention to you four things. Number one, what God says about the unborn in the womb. Secondly, what God says in his word. Thirdly, what God says about wisdom when making choices. And then fourthly, what God says to the women. Let's talk about the womb. What goes on in the womb is special to God. In the womb is creation. In the womb is formation. In the womb is identification. In the womb is destination. God is working in the womb. He told us to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as prophets to the nation. So before you are born, God's working something out. And he's working it out in the womb. Can't act like ain't nothing going on in there. In Psalm 139, David wrote this in verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained before me was written in your book before one of them came to be. You can't discount what God is doing in the womb. I was looking at this story in the book of Luke. When Mary went to visit Elizabeth. In Luke chapter 1, verse 41, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. 
and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 43, but why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. You can't tell me God ain't working in the womb. The baby is not just leaping, he's leaping for joy. There's something going on there. It is clear that life and significance is in the womb. The womb should be the safest and most nurturing place for the precious unborn. Today, the womb is the most dangerous place in America. That's the womb. Now I want to talk about the word. Here's what God says in his word when we say, does God really say it? In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, a haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush to evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension. God hates hands that shed innocent blood. In Proverbs 31, Solomon said, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. I believe the unborn have rights. Who's going to speak for them? Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. And this is what the Bible says about your body. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? I'm talking about saved folks now. I'm talking about believers now. If you don't know God and you're not un if you're not saved, I ain't talking to you. But if you're saved, if you're born again, if you are redeemed, if you love God with all your heart, he says your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You are bought with the price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Make that choice. Paul said this in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. This is your reasonable service, King James put it. So he said you ought to at least be reasonable with your body. So we talked about the womb, we talked about the word, now we want to talk about the wisdom to make your choice. Joshua talked about that when he was finishing up his life. He recognized the challenges ahead for the people of Israel as he was about to die. He said, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshiped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you're gonna serve. Whether the gods your of your forefathers, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are now living. 
Now, if you go back and you look at the gods of the Amorites, one of the things that they were doing in their worship, they were offering up their infants and their babies to Moloch as a sacrifice. He said, but as for me and my house, we made a choice. We choose to serve the Lord. Proverbs 8.10 says, choose my instructions instead of silver, knowledge rather than choice gold, the way of the Lord, the word of God. He said, if you're going to choose, choose the way of God, choose the word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, this day I call heaven and earth as a witness against you. I have set before you life and death. This is God talking. I've set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now, choose life. God is a God of choice. You don't have to argue about you have the right to choose. God says, I agree with you, but he tells you what to choose. Choose life so that you and your children may live. God absolutely supports a woman's right to choose. He supports a man's right to choose too. God doesn't have a problem with our freedom to choose. He gives us that. He is interested in what you choose. When you make your choice, was it based on what God said? When you made your choice, did you acknowledge him before you made your choice and ask that he direct your path? When you made your choice, did you make it to please God or to please yourself? Did you say, Lord, not my will, but your will be done? See, most of the time we find ourselves in a predicament and we have to make that last choice. That's not the first choice we made. We made several choices that got us there that wasn't proper. Paul said this in the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't think like the world think. Don't, don't buy their story. Don't buy their narrative. Don't do what they do. But you should be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. If you began your day by making godly choices, you will never have to make ungodly choices. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Did God not say in all your ways acknowledge him? He'll direct your path. Stay out of the situation where you've made your own decisions without God. You let the influences of the world help you make decisions and then when you get down to the end you're in an ungodly situation. So I've talked about the womb, I've talked about the word, I've talked about the wisdom to make the right choices. Now I want to talk about the woman. There's a question that comes to me when I think of this institution of abortion. That question is, where is the men in all of this? Men seem to be as disengaged as Adam was in the garden when the serpent was talking to Eve. 
women are often pressured by men to have sex and then they're pressured by men to have an abortion to avoid being responsible for child support and the care of the child. Women often feel they cannot do it alone and thus terminate the baby in the womb. Some feel alone, some are left hurt, some are left embarrassed, isolated, feeling guilty. I'm reminded of the woman that Jesus came in contact with who was in a dire predicament. And I looked at how Jesus responded to her with grace and truth. John chapter 8 verse 2 says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees, those are church folk, brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now, I'm wondering how they caught her. The law said you had to have at least two witnesses. So if two people had to catch her. So where were they at? Looked like they were either peeping tongues Oh, they had some issues going on themselves, but they, they say they caught her. One translation say they caught her in the very act. Think about that. But they brought this woman to Jesus, and they made her stand before the group. Think about that, this woman standing before all of these men out there alone. And they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? Now this woman did what she was accused of. She was brought out and was made to stand before a group of men who were prepared to stone her. That's the way it is in church now when somebody made a decision or made a mistake, had a situation. Sometimes they're afraid to come to church because we're ready to stone them. They referred to the law that said such women should be stoned. What they did not mention, the law said the man should be stoned too. But once again, a woman stands alone to face the scorn, the embarrassment. Can you see her standing there with her head down? facing the possibility of death for a choice she made. Verse 6 said, But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. At this time, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman standing there. When Jesus finished with those men, they walked away and nobody was qualified to throw the stone at this woman. 
Jesus straighten up in verse 10 and ask her, woman, where are your accusers? Where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sure, she said. But Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. The statistic says that there are women that are listening to me now that have gone through an abortion for one reason or another. I don't know how you feel. You may be good with it. You may have a struggle with it. You may still feel some kind of way as we say. But in the same way at this moment, in, this, in the same way at this moment in this place today, there's no one in this building that is qualified to throw a stone at you if you've had an abortion. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you but he said, go and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more. He gave her an opportunity for a brand new start. He released her from her hurt, her accusation, and her guilt because of the choices that she made. Here's what I want to tell you now. Jesus is in the house today. He's here for anyone. He's here for everyone who's made choices that you know God is not pleased with. You, have, you may have been abused. You may, have, you may have been the abuser. You may be affected by the choices you made. Someone in your family may be still affected by choices that you made. But I want to tell you that it's not over. God is able to heal, to restore, to rebuild to forgive. I can't give you the biblical response to abortion without giving you the godly response to every one of us who have had sin in our lives and had, come, had to come to him for forgiveness and cleansing. Jesus is here today to release you from any hurt, any pain, any guilt, any isolation, any embarrassment, or any feeling that you may be dealing with. And I'm going to broaden this from just this narrow topic that I've been talking about in abortion, but whatever is going on in your life for whatever choice you've ever made that you're still dealing with. When Jesus intervened in the case of this woman caught in adultery, there was no one left but him and her. So today it's only between Jesus and you. I want you to allow him to do what he does by ministering to you.